Good morning, everybody. Buenos dias, I guess. Um, I am Massimiliano Gioni. I'm the guest curator of the exhibition Apparencia Desnuda, Desire and the Object in the work of Marcel Duchamp and Jeff Koons, even. And uh, welcome you all today for uh, this very special uh, days of uh, special day of uh, um, talks and panels and conversations with really a stellar group of guests. I'm very thankful to all the guests for being here uh, and very thankful to Humex and the entire team for organizing uh, this great exhibition and uh, uh, also this day of programs and which will be also followed by a few other weekly events in the weeks coming up. So look up also on the website. There are great people coming also next week. I believe Thierry de Juve is coming, and uh, a few other um, Duchampian aficionados and uh, Kuhn's lovers. Um, I'm not going to bore you about the exhibition. The best way to mm, think about an exhibition is to go and see it. Um, I'm thankful that you took the time to be here today. Outside is a beautiful day, and uh, so I hope you're dedication will be rewarded by a wonderful panel. Whenever I go to a panel and I see a room full of people, I'm reminded of a joke by Erwin Panofsky that used to say that people in Hamburg, if they could choose between going to a panel or going about heaven and going to heaven, they would rather go to the panel. And um, I guess there are many uh, people from Hamburg here tonight. And <laughs> I guess we can start. I'll uh, pass on the word to Julieta Gonzalez, who is the artistic director of the uh, Humex uh, Museum, and she will introduce the first uh, guests. And thank you so much again. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Massimiliano. Um, voy a hablar en español ahora, pero luego en inglés con, con los ponentes. Eh, muy buenos días, muchas gracias por estar aquí. Eh, en el inicio de este programa público en torno a la exposición eh, Apariencia desnuda, el objeto y el deseo en la obra de Marcel Duchamp y Jeff Koons aún. Eh, hoy tenemos con nosotros y vamos a hablar un poco de este contexto. Eh, el contexto temprano de la obra de Jeff Koons, es decir, ese Nueva York de finales de los 70 y principios de los 80. Jeff Koons se muda a Nueva York en el año 77, justo el año del apagón, es un momento en el que Nueva York está en, en un momento de declive y eh, tanto Linda, como Jeffrey Deitch son, Linda Yablonsky como Jeffrey Deitch son parte íntegra de, de este momento también. Eh, Linda Yablonsky es crítico de arte y ha vivido en Nueva York también desde los años 70. Eh, pues ha formado parte de esta escena artística de Nueva York, siendo, escribiendo para distintos medios, entre ellos Art Forum, actualmente también The Art Newspaper. Y eh, más que nada también Linda lleva ya años eh, haciendo una investigación para la primera biografía de Jeff Koons, que va a salir publicada próximamente. Eh, por lo tanto, también nos va a hablar hoy un poco de eh, esa investigación que ha hecho, de los archivos, de, de todo, toda la información que ha ido recabando en este proceso de escritura de esta biografía de Jeff Koons. Jeffrey Deitch es pues, un galerista muy reconocido de Nueva York. Eh, eh, pues, su galería Deitch Projects eh, pues, fue parte fundamental también de ese Nueva York de los 80, de los 90. Eh, pues, ha sido muy cercano a Jeff Koons, pero también eh, fue asesor de colecciones como la de Dakis Joanu y curador de exposiciones muy importantes y que definieron momentos como post-human eh, eh, hace de, algunas décadas, ¿no? y donde también figuró el trabajo de Jeff Koons. Entonces, pues hoy, eh, y ahora voy a cambiar al inglés para hablar con, con los ponentes, eh, pues vamos a hablar de ese contexto más temprano. Gracias. Now I switch to English. <laughs> so as I, as I was saying in Spanish before, um, Jeff moved to New York in 77, which was the year of the blackout. And the time in which New York, he moved in 76. Well, some biographies have it at 77. <laughs> But you're almost, okay. <laughs> well, that's why we have you here, Linda. <laughs> To clarify all the facts. <laughs> so, um, anyhow, New York in the, the second half of the 70s was in a period of blight and decay and um, 
actually witnessed a massive exodus of the middle class to the suburbs. And, um, but then this gave an enormous opportunity to artists, you know, who could rent very, for very big spaces for very low prices. And, uh, and it was also a thriving art scene as well, uh, also in the, the alternative uh, scene, like the um, nightclubs, the punks, etc. So, in a way, you're you're part of this, and um, perhaps we, well, I'd like us to to elaborate a little bit on this this New York of the late 70s, and perhaps um, Jeffrey. Um, well, once we speak a little bit with Linda about this, to talk about the early 80s and how that art scene is beginning to reconfigure itself in a different way. Well, well the, the most famous newspaper headline of New yeah. York City of the 1970s was a New York Post cover, Ford to City Drop Dead. That was the president just abandoning New York City. Yes. It was a lost cause. So and I'd like to point out that was the moment Donald Trump made his move. <laughs> uh, this, this devastated, bankrupt city was an artist's paradise. Uh, for instance, my first apartment, I, my trajectory in New York is very similar to Jeff's. I arrived in 1974. My first apartment, rent controlled, $165 a month. And a I only large paid 80. Okay. <laughs> late, oh, late, late, later, I found a place for $62 a month. But, <laughs> but, but that showed that, that the, the worst thing for an artist who wants to develop their career is to have a conventional nine to five job. Uh, that even uh, a good teaching job can put a damper on creativity. So. I, don't, I, I was just about the only person in my circle who had a job. I worked as an assistant at a gallery. Almost everyone else somehow got along, and so it was quite a remarkable economy. Uh, from a conventional point of view, very, very difficult. But from an artistic point of view, this was everything that artists wanted. It wasn't that much different than Mexico City, well, actually. Uh, low cost of living. It was possible to have a part-time job two days a week and the rest of the time make your work. At the time, every other artist you met actually had a band. Uh, the, the whole scene, the whole downtown Manhattan scene, which is where the whole creative community lived, was uh, kind of developed out of the music scene, as you mentioned. The, uh, uh, every night, people went to the same clubs and supported the bands. And out of this, a whole culture evolved. Would you say that's true? Yes. So in addition, this New York City was, this is the last period when one city was indisputably the advanced cultural capital of the world. So it wasn't just American artists, artists from many European countries, Latin American countries, uh, even Ai Weiwei from China. So this is where ambitious young artists, musicians came. <laughs> and it was an international community and the small number of collectors, patrons, curators, they came as well. Well, it's also, I'm, uh, just to add to that, there was this amazing wave of young people who came to New York from everywhere at, in the same two years, basically between 1976 and 78 or 9. And uh, they all started meeting each other because they all lived in the same neighborhood and they would see each other every day on the street or every night in, the, in a bar and in one of the clubs where the bands were performing. And this, in fact, is what brought Jeff Koons to New York. He was in Chicago at the time going to school, or he was just out of school, art school, and uh, heard about these bands like Patti Smith and Talking Heads, and he knew he had to be there too up until that moment, had no 
desire to be in New York, but then he knew that's, if he was going to be an artist, that's where he had to be. So he arrived in this, in the fall of 1976, and the first person he met was David Byrne, the lead singer of Talking Heads, and he was staying across the street from a club called CBGB's, which is where punk rock started in New York, and so was immediately involved in this scene. And, uh, uh, kind of had no money, <laughs> kind of, you know, slept on the floor of somebody's loft, moved in with uh, a guy that he met with, that he met there uh, uh, for a short time, got his own apartment, got a job at the Museum of Modern Art uh, as uh, uh, selling tickets, a kind of typical job for a young artist, working as a museum guard, or you know, there were, he met a lot of other people, uh, young people who were working at the museum. One of them was Valerie Smith, uh, uh, a, uh, who was an intern, a curatorial intern, and later put Jeff in a show in 1983 that was very important for him at Artist Space, a group show. Um, so he had a very kind of typical beginning, I would say, just, just like everyone else. Um, But uh, he was kind of slower than a lot of his peers at uh, getting anyone to notice his work. So he was making these um, little inflatable sculptures of, he was getting to know the city as well, so walking around every day, looking around for things that interested him. And uh, he started buying these inflatable plastic flowers and animals like rabbits or pigs, and uh, making little installations out of them with Robert Smithson kind of mirrors. And uh, he couldn't sell them, he didn't show them, so he started giving them away to people that he met. And um, one of those people, or two of those people, were collectors named Don and Mira Rubel, who would give a party every year after, or every two years after the Whitney Biennial, because they lived around the corner, and they gave a party for the artists, and uh, you know, Jeff came to one of these, I think it was 1978, I might have the date wrong, um, and he rang the bell, and the, um, and Mira answered the bell, and who is it? It's Jeff Coons. And, she, and yes, I'm here for the party. She said, well, it was last night. And uh, so how he had the, he missed the opening of the biennial, but they let him in and made him some dinner. And uh, the next day he sent them one of these inflatable sculptures as a gift. And they ended up being the first people to buy Jeff Koons uh, a short a few years later and uh, became his first collectors, in fact. Another one he put in the window of a bar on 2nd Avenue called Slugger Ann's, where lots of people would see it when they walked by. Or he would give one to uh, artist friends that he met to put in their studios, so when people came by to see their work, they would also see this Jeff Koons. And ask. it was very smart, play it was sort of product placement <laughs> that was, uh, at least, uh, so people who didn't know anything about him and hadn't met him started seeing this very, very, very different kind of sculpture. Um, maybe we should start to move up 1979-80 when um, painting returned to the fore in New York. So, uh, yeah, we well, should, we, we should mention that, <laughs> see, that Jeff, even though he was doing something so different yeah. from most of the younger artists, and he didn't connect to the center right away. He did have a remarkable compass that brought him toward the center. So rather than getting a job someplace obscure, it was the ground floor of the Museum of Modern Art. And he understood that it, it was important to go to the Rubel's party. It's a quite a remarkable thing that they a, a stranger comes to their door after they've cleaned up this massive party with hundreds of people and they generously invited him in and made him spaghetti 
and started a relationship that continues to this day. And that's typical of the intimacy of the New York art world at that time, that this was not an art market, this was a community, and people connected, and it was a very, very open community. So, um, he has his first, would I say, institutional showing at the New Museum, no, in 1980, with the, the new, this sort of shop window installation. Again, it's uh, interesting because, as Massimiliano was saying, and it's a part of the way he's also articulated so, um, the show, this idea of the shop window and that Jeff's first institutional display is actually a window to the street, no, a vitrine. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about that, for you to talk a bit about that context of New York, of the galleries, the museums, the artists who were around Jeff Koons were also engaging in some of, in similar issues to him at the time. We can think of a later show at the New Museum, such as uh, Damaged Goods, where artists like um, Louise Lawler or Alan McCollum, Heim Steinbach were also there. But let's go back to the, eight, to the early 80s, and can we talk a little bit about that specific context, now in the arts, in the gallery scene, but also in the institutional uh, framework? Well, I would say that by 1979, there were 50-some-odd galleries in Soho, and there was a whole kind of commercial establishment, not that the work was so commercial, but uh, there was a, a quite a, it was the center of, the world center of contemporary art. But for the artists of Jeff's generation, and younger, there weren't too many places to show. And like I said, this whole scene evolved from the nightclub scene where, in fact, there were shows. People had exhibitions in bars and nightclubs. Um, like, there was a club called the Mud Club where there were a number of exhibitions and performances and, in fact, was kind of an extension of an artist's studio where artists would meet and talk about art, what they were doing, what they wanted to do, and they would uh, visit each other's studios. But at the time, by 1979, um, Julian Schnabel and uh, uh, Ross Blechner and uh, uh, David Sally were showing, and there was, the, and, and uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat was uh, on the scene, hadn't made a painting yet, but was about to. Uh, and Keith Haring, they were all part of this early scene of kind of expressionist painting, neo-expressionist painting. Nobody was doing sculpture, <laughs> particularly not this kind of sculpture, uh, of uh, ready-made, store-bought things. I mean, Jeff bought these vacuum cleaners and shampoo, rug shampooers and put them up on lights, uh, and kind of Dan Flavin-ish lights, and uh, hung them on the wall, along with a lot of other household appliances, like a, a toaster or a telephone or a tea kettle. And uh, a lot, I've spoken to a lot of other artists who saw the work in his apartment, or he didn't have a studio, and uh, didn't know what to make of it, but it was so different that um, they were very intrigued. And Julian Schnabel was one of them who saw this appliance work and the inflatables and introduced him to a dealer named Mary Boone. But he also went to a bar called Max's Kansas City where all the artists hung out and introduced him to artists there and tells the story about introducing Jeff to some of the, his friends at the bar and uh, one of them asking Jeff, well, what do you do? And Jeff said, I present the new. And <laughs> Julian said he was lucky they didn't punch him to the floor when they, <laughs> they wanted to hit him. <laughs> and uh, like, who is this guy? I present the new. But that's, in fact, what Jeff was doing. Everything was about the new. He was new. His work was new. This was the new museum. Everything was new, and he worked everything around this conceptual framework. 
for several years. This is actually the pre-new, right? <laughs> so, so, uh, but, and this was at the windows of the new museum, which at the time was a, kind of a storefront inside the new school on 14th Street and 5th Avenue in New York. And 14th Street was a, sh a commercial shopping street where you, Jeff could buy vacuum cleaners and um, novelties like inflatable flowers. So this was kind of his territory. I don't know how many people saw this installation from the art world. A lot of people saw it going down 14th Street and thought it was an appliance store and went in and tried to buy some and uh, uh, only to discover it was an art gallery. And, um, and uh, uh, <laughs> Jeff, uh, early on through a friend, had met Marsha Tucker, who was the woman who founded the new museum. Uh, and a friend was having, a, a, a friend from art school was having a show there and uh, he met Alan Schwartzman, the first curator at the new museum. And um, they offered him the windows. So this is a great opportunity for him. And he had all these appliances in the gallery. Uh, there was a gallery inside. And uh, the whole idea was it had to be new, unused, virginal. Not, it, it couldn't be turned on. It couldn't be touched. So he had the whole thing laid out on the floor and was very carefully putting it all together. And I think somebody, one of the, somebody who worked there messed with one of them and he threw it out because it was no longer new. Someone had touched it. And Alan remembers watching this happen, you know, and him taking a lot of care to arrange everything and hang it in the windows. And it was quite remarkable. I should say that you know, up until 1985, uh, Jeff made everything by hand in his apartment, sweating it out, polishing, putting things together. And even though he uses assistance today, he's still a very hands-on artist, which is a much more complicated issue that I don't think we have time to get into. But um, everything was at his expense and by his hand, including this very first. And the picture, this, is called the new Jeff Koons. And everything this artist would become is in this picture, which was one of those kind of, at the time in the 1950s America, I mean, my parents did this with me, you know, the photographer, you go to a shopping, center and some commercial photographer would make portraits of the children and that's what this was but uh, there he is with his coloring book he's seven years old he's taking art lessons and uh, looking directly at the camera uh, and uh, smiling and kind of happy to have found himself in this situation and if you meet Jeff today this is the picture that you get immediately. So it was all there at age seven. And uh, this is uh, the new Jeff Koons before the world met him. There's only one thing wrong with this photograph. Yes. Do you know what it is? Go ahead. Jeff is left-handed, not right-handed. That's right. <laughs> wow. Well, so then we yeah. get to yeah. the fact that Jeff is has to pay to buy all these appliances. Unlike yes. other artists who spend virtually nothing on their art materials, Jean-Michel Basquiat painted on windows that he found on the street, Jeff had to buy these brand new vacuum cleaners and appliances. So working at the Museum of Modern Art did not generate enough money, even though he claims, and I think it's affirmed by museum staff, that he was the all-time greatest seller of memberships in the Museum of Modern Art lobby. <laughs> so Jeff needed to make more money. And just out of a Hollywood movie, how do you make as much money as fast and as easily as possible? You go to Wall Street and start selling penny stocks. And that's what he did. And so Jeff developed a reputation as 
a, a Wall Street whiz even before he developed a reputation as an essential artist. So I remember in the downtown scene, I worked in a bank, and people would come to me, he said, do you know Jeff Koons? He works, he works in a bank too. And people didn't really know the difference between a bucket shop I, I worked at, Citibank. And, and so for months, people said, have you met Jeff Koons? And finally, I met him. And he was just like that picture. So Jeff was pretty much fully formed at age seven. And something essential of Jeff, he absorbed this whole American aesthetic of sales and that if you buy this product, it's good for you, it's good for me, it's good for everybody. And that attitude of Jeff's was completely contrary to this sort of very downtown cool attitude of almost every other artist. Well, we were coming out of the Vietnam War, the Watergate scandal, and uh, 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 in that time of during when Nixon was president, uh, the FBI was uh, clocking people like us uh, and uh, uh, making enemies of um, half of America, kind of the beginning of what's going on now. And uh, so everyone had no respect for authority at all. <laughs> And uh, Jeff didn't exactly embrace it, but he wasn't um, complaining about it to the same degree, shall we say. Well, also, Jeff looked very different than also the other artists on the scene. So this was a time of almost every artist wore a black t-shirt, black jeans, black boots, scruffy hair, whether they were male or female, it's the same. And, you know, Jeff, had his careful haircut, uh, uh, kind of windbreaker. You know, he looked like he came from the suburbs of York, Pennsylvania, which he did. And I have to say that Jeff has always been himself, even though he's in many ways a self-invented character, like Duchamp was, he's very true to where he came from. It, 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 he was a, one out of a thousand the art was completely different than anyone else. He looked different. His talk was different. And gradually, people, he, bega he begot a reputation as someone significant on the scene. But he was about five years ahead of his time. Maybe, Linda, you can pick up on that. Yes, I, I think that's true. Well, uh, even though he had a lot of friends among artists in the beginning and only hung out with artists, a lot of them started not to like him personally because he had this, you know, he was kind of a bumpkin, a country, uh, he came from a rural place, uh, he was uh, very provincial, and uh, he's also very worldly, but he remains provincial in, in some respects. And because he had this job on Wall Street, he did dress differently, he, but he talked about art in a way that people still don't understand uh, in, in kind of as art as a, as a, a spirit as a as good for you as good for the human spirit that it would uh, how a vacuum cleaner could have a, uh, a transformational effect on one's uh, being that this was the agent of a state of being that one could not really attain, which was a state of perfection, of perfect balance, of perfect harmony. That was his goal with each of these artworks that he made. And a lot of people didn't get it, but they liked it. They were intrigued by it. They were intrigued by him and at the same time were put off by him because he was so weird. Uh, whereas, let's see what... Well, that's, well, that's, that's the Jeff Koons look at that. Yes, time. that's. Uh... <laughs> okay, so that's you know that he could be selling aluminum siding door to door. Yes. There, well, also when Jeff was growing up, also when I was growing up, uh, there were a lot of door to door salesmen in in American suburbs and towns, and among them were the Fuller Brush Man and the Hoover Man selling uh, appliances. 
to people who didn't live in urban areas and couldn't access these things very easily. Uh, and that was part of, an influ the part of this influence. Uh, I'm not sure where this was, but... No. This uh, could be in Venezuela, in fact, where you're from, <laughs> yes. Uh, Jeff was in a group show in 1980, at, uh, uh, almost the same time, a little bit after the new museum window show, uh, in uh, Caracas, with about a dozen other New York artists. Uh, and that was the first time he showed the, this Canister, vacuum cleaner canister, which uh, is the beginning of what became the encased vacuum cleaners and plexiglass boxes, which you'll see in the museum, uh, in the current exhibition. Uh, or I, I don't know should where we, else this we, could well, be, actually. I think we, we should I follow think, up on this fascinating yeah. instance of the show in Venezuela, in Jeff. So this is... so. I first saw Jeff's work in the back office of the Mary Boone Gallery. And Mary Boone's gallery was just an extended closet, actually. She was very clever. She had gotten a section of an art storage company, but it was right beneath Leo Castelli's gallery. So everybody coming up to visit Leo Castelli, Sonnabend, Emmerich, had to go by Mary Boone's little gallery, which I did. And in her little office, also just uh, this is important. She had a window on the street, which the other galleries had windows, but they were on upper floors. She was people could, there was a wall, but you, people could see that gallery was there before they even entered the building. Right. right. So that there was, thanks to Julian Schnabel's recommendation, there was an early Jeff appliance piece. There was a toaster on fluorescent bulbs hanging next to Mary's desk. And that's the first time I saw the work, and I was astonished. And for me, it's, uh, I still remember that moment, because we, we often we look for something that we've never seen experienced before. And of course, everyone sees toasters, fluorescent tubes, but somehow this juxtaposition and putting it on a wall as art was totally radical, even though there are lots of precedents coming through from pop art and Dan Flavin. But Jeff expected that he was going to have a show with Mary Boone, and she was the number one showcase for young artists at that time. But something happened where she had promised him a May exhibition, and then she wanted to change the date. You must know the more the details. I do, it. and okay. it's not pretty. Okay. Well, t tell tell uh, us I, tell us the details of what <laughs> happened. So Jeff was almost there, showing in the major gallery for young artists in the world, and then something happened. Well, uh, Mary uh, met Jeff first because uh, Julian Schnabel wanted to buy Jeff's car, and uh, I guess she brought the check over. Uh, and she didn't understand his work and wasn't that interested, but uh, uh, Mary listened to her artists, and all of the artists she took into the gallery came as recommendations of other artists. So uh, Ross Blackner and Julian Schnabel told her she had to take a look at this guy, Kuntz, and so she did take him on, and she uh, scheduled a show with him, she expected him to show vacuum cleaners, but he made a different proposal. What he wanted to do, he was still in this new period, everything the new, and what he wanted to do was show a brand new car on a turntable, take down the wall in front of the window so that when people walked by on West Broadway, they would look in the gallery and see this car, brand new, as if it were a car showroom, but not. He was turning it into an art piece, and, uh, and a very conceptual art piece that was involved in uh, the culture that we live in, which was uh, you know, not New York City, but certainly America was a car culture. Um, it was new. Uh, it, cars were kind of a fetish. 
uh, it was a consumer object. Uh, and the car was going to cost Mary $30,000. Well, at, and they were both drinking a lot at the time. So, and Jeff didn't have the money to buy the car, so he expected Mary to buy the car, to come up with the money to buy the car. Mary was running her gallery, even though it was very successful, even at that point, but in 1979 and 80, being very successful meant selling a painting for five or ten thousand dollars. She was running the gallery on seven thousand dollars a month and then having nothing left over so she couldn't afford to do the show and they had an argument about it and uh, either Jeff quit or she said I'm not I, she canceled the show it was kind of mutual and Jeff uh, picked up his slides the next day he had uh, 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 transparencies of his work and walked a block away to another gallery run by Anina Nozai who was Mary Boone's arch rival as a dealer. They hated each other and uh, Anina was intrigued by the vacuum cleaners and put a couple of them in a group show and sold two of them and decided to buy one herself and Jeff thought, okay, now I have a new gallery. And he was planning a show. And Nina Nozai was the person who unleashed, uh, in a way, uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat on the art world in his first a group show and then a solo show. Um, and so uh, and Jeff took one of his encased vacuum cleaners to the dealer's apartment and installed it. And two days later, she called him and said, Jeff, I want you to take it back. I can't live with it. And uh, he was very hurt and very confused, but he did that, and that was the end of that relationship. And so it would be five years between that moment and um, his first solo show, which takes us back to Caracas. So, <laughs> so shall we go well, direct? There, so. There, there was a young art historian named Ronnie Cohn who yes. studied all the early 20th century isms, and she thought, well, what she should do is invent her own ism. So she invented an ism called energism and inspired a young man who was in New York, who was Venezuelan, and they together organized an exhibition on energism in Caracas that included Jeff and many other artists. Uh, what is particularly significant about this, this show would have just sort of been buried, but a young man, a high school student at the time in Caracas, named Meyer Weissman, saw the exhibition. And it, it inspired him tremendously. He actually says he was not in high school, he was older. Okay, well, so, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so Meyer then, the next year, moves to New York City and enrolls in Parsons School of Design as an undergraduate. And he was a very ambitious person and like a number of people coming into the art world, unclear whether he was going to be an artist, entrepreneur, art dealer, but he eventually opens the most interesting, unusual gallery on the Lower East Side, in the middle of this wave of neo-expressionist painting, he opened... And graffiti. Graffiti, and graffiti was huge. New York was, we should have said in the right. 70s, became right. covered in graffiti. And uh, there were graffiti artists painting all the subway trains, which was uh, a kind of moving museum through New York and uh, gave, eventually got tied up with hip-hop culture, and that was another... Uh, source of energy that was in New York in the late 70s. And so the Lower East Side, where this gallery uh, in the East Village, where Meyer Weissman and two of his fellow students from Parsons opened a gallery called International with Monument as a kind of sleek <laughs> conceptual art gallery. Uh, there had been, uh, the East Village was then kind of unruly, uh, tied to graffiti and neo pop and uh, uh, this was different. It, it, as different as Jeff's work was. Yeah. 
a, a, a clean space that looked like nothing else there. And Meyer sought out Jeff, remembering that show in Caracas, and Jeff's debut exhibition at International with Monument. Well, we have to give Peter Halley okay. some credit for yes. this. Uh, yes. Peter Halley was another young artist who had put Jeff, one, a triple decker vacuum cleaner, in a show called Science Fiction in 1982, I think, uh, and uh, at a gallery where you used to work, <laughs> John Weber, and uh, at, at, in the same, oh no, it wasn't, in, it wasn't on West Broadway, sorry, anyway, a lot of people saw that there was a Duchamp in that show, actually, and uh, uh, the work of a lot of artists. People really noticed Jeff's triple decker vacuum cleaner, which, like these, has its own lighting, and the gallery walls were painted black. It was very dramatically lit, uh, and there was this whole simulationist uh, thesis around this show. Um, and uh, so Peter got interested in Jeff's work and Meyer Weissman uh, took Peter Halley, who was a painter, uh, uh, took him on first and uh, uh, the gallery also showed Richard Prince and Laurie Simmons, a lot of artists of this generation. Uh, but uh, it was Peter that encouraged Meyer who then remembered having seen Jeff in that show in Venezuela. So let's talk a little bit more about Equilibrium, also Jeffrey, the, the, that first show at International with Monument. Yeah, so this is kind of what else was going this on is the at context. the time. Uh, show this how, is the context. How different Jeff was. Yeah. yeah. Yes. That's uh, Jean Michel, that's contrasted to what, you, and that's Keith Haring. It's what you saw a few minutes ago, Jeff, in the suit. Um, this was uh, the show that I mentioned Valerie Smith uh, created for an artist space and he was still working with the new and this is, I see new, this was a ready-made advertisement for cigarettes and there's the new Jeff Koons on the wall. Um, and this we is have the, six minutes so that's oh, why I'm I, rushing things a bit. This is, I, at least I'd like to get to the okay, Sun event yeah. show which maybe would... All right, so this is his first solo show, which was in this gallery, International with Monument, and had three parts. Uh, posters for Nike of basketball players, and uh, they were actual advertisements for Nike. Uh, these equilibrium tanks that were tanks, again, kind of handmade by Jeff with the a floating basketball in the tank that was it, supposed to It's actually to be. very well represented in the show. At the yes, Home there is this, the first this, one in the show. The show. And uh, the first time he had work cast, which he made bronzes of life, um, kind of life, a lifeboat, an aqualung, a snorkel. It all had to do with life, of the breathing, except the tank, the ball is so still and he talks about it as a kind of fetus in the womb, and it is very womb-like, but it's also very chilling because it seems both dead and about to be born at the same time. And this sets up a polarity in Jeff's work that exists to this day and why people argue, I think, is why people argue about him so much, that you know the same people who like the work and also hate it at the same time it's in the work. There are two ways of looking and feeling about and understanding Jeff's work that he maintains, and it started here with equilibrium, that there is this kind of fulcrum which can tip in either direction. So uh, this is what first got him wider attention, and people started taking him seriously, even though still they didn't get it. it but no one had seen anything like this before was completely well thought out. He had a thesis, he could articulate it. Most artists were just kind of finding themselves and were in awe of him, actually. And this changed the whole discourse in the New York art yeah. world. This is and more of the show. And it, it changed, so there's a sort of beginning of the 80s, which is more free, expressionist, the strength of graffiti, and then he begins a more conceptual discourse. 
much later. Okay. The other show at International with Monuments a year later, which is Luxury and Degradation, which again is very well represented in, in Massimiliano's show at the museum. Yes, and, and so today, mm. if artists appear publicly drunk, they are ostracized. You know, the, the, things became so much more professional. But in those days, people really drank. And that was completely <laughs> normal to drink to almost the point of staggering and passing out. And drugs. Night. Yes. <laughs> and, and so I mentioned one of the things that marks almost every important artist is there's a whole conceptual structure, but the work also very much comes out of them and their life experience. And so amazing how Jeff took all his drunken evenings and somehow turned it into this brilliant work that Jim Beam containers filled with actual bourbon. And everything else in the show were cast, that's his first stainless steel pieces and they were cast and they were all drinking paraphernalia and was actually inspired by his friend Jeff Plate, uh, who was an, a terrible alcoholic and became a drug addict and died later. And uh, this is when Jeff kind of thought maybe he should stop drinking and get serious and and did. And so uh, even though he says this was kind of inspired by Jeff played his best friend whom we then became estranged from because of the drinking and uh, made this show which really I think every artist who saw this was inspired by it they were just um, it was so completely well thought out and different and when he made the show he was also, at this point, Meyer Weissman, the dealer from the gallery, had made a deal to take himself, Jeff, Peter Halley, and a younger artist named Ashley Bickerton as a package into the Sonnebend Gallery, which was a floor above Castelli on West Broadway, was one of the most important galleries in the world. And Jeff was all, it, this came up a little suddenly, and Jeff was already making this cast stainless steel for this luxury and degradation show which was a kind of cautionary tale to people that the things that glittered and were attractive and inebriating would eventually bring you down. That was the message. And so the Sonnebend show, with the group show with the four artists, Jeff continued to make cast stainless steel things, and one of them was Rabbit, which was different from everything else and which probably everyone knows, sold for $91 million at auction three days ago. Um, and that was in the show, which opened one week prior to this one. And at that point, all four artists who were getting a lot of publicity, thanks to a magazine article that put them on the cover, they were... They wiped out Julian Schnabel, Jean-Michel Basquiat. It's like they didn't exist. And these were the new guys. Well, the Neo Geo guys. Uh, So-called Neo Geo, although Peter Halley was the only Neo Geo involved. And um, this was the career-defining moment, or the beginning of the career-defining moment, which would come two years later, really. You wanna... Would you like to add something about that? Mm. We had some images of the... Oh, oh, no, this is damaged goods. Of the press. Uh, okay, here's Jeff blowing up the rabbit that eventually became this uh, stainless steel sculpture, which is in the show at the um, Who Mix. And also, this, this, that image shows the level of transformation also yes. that Jeff achieved. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an artwork by another artist who made Hollywood kind of headshots of all the up-and-coming young art stars of the moment. And you see you know, uh, Cindy Sherman and Jeff and... Uh, Jenny Holzer and Robert Longo, who was the guy to beat at the time. And, and where, yes, and Ashley. Anyway. Uh, this is later, so I don't... Uh, this is the luxury and degradation show that we were just speaking of. Um, this, 
This is one of the reviews of that group show where the rabbit first appeared and they, all the, the critics hated it because these guys were getting so much publicity and that they couldn't see past it. They couldn't see past the so-called hype to the art. But uh, uh, the artists saw the art and the collectors who were interested in serious art saw the art. And uh, they all, uh, this show was enormously successful. They sold everything by everybody. Could you add a little bit about that show, um, Jeffrey? Uh, the sure. Ton Event show? Well, there's a, another interesting anecdote. Mm -hmm. So it, it was largely orchestrated by Meyer Weissman, mm -hmm. who wanted tr to transition from being a gallerist to an artist himself. But also there was an art consultant involved. And yes. the, the gallery still that defined the time was Mary Boone. And so she wanted to take all these people on. But this art consultant had been banned from Mary Boone. It was, you know, there was a lot of viciousness because uh, Mary Boone didn't like her approach. And so Ileana Sonnebin was a very unlikely place for this. She was so much older, the gallery had a very different tradition. And so with the help of this art consultant, because Meyer Weissman did not know Ileana Sonnebend, yeah. this was orchestrated. And she was given this entire art movement. And very effective because her prestige, having shown Rauschenberg, mm -hmm. Gilbert and George, Gibito Akanshi, she immediately endorsed these artists with the weight of her history. Which was, as a risk taker, I mean, it's, it wasn't that far-fetched when Vito Akanji was, you know, jerking off in the gallery under a ramp and Gilbert and George were singing with their bodies painted gold. I mean, she it was kind of had a history tradition. of outrage. Yes, yes. But she, she was not going around yeah. to the East yeah. Village. She was at that stage. She yeah. was not really engaged with this. Well, I think she was. Uh, and because Ileana was a collector as well as an art dealer and she... I mean, her collection is world famous, but uh, she was looking for new art, and she, she had she actually was, seen uh, Jeff's work uh, a year or two before she he, and wasn't interested. <laughs> she was her program at that time was much more Anselm Kiefer, yes, Gerhard uh, That's where she was. That's true. Yeah. So this uh, 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 same with Castelli. They had had their day in the sun, and they were kind of you know, old hat at this moment. And this show gave that gallery new life. And uh, it was the most interesting, for me, the most interesting gallery in Soho in the 1980s. Um, anyway, this put them all on the map and uh, Ileana Sonnebend took Jeff on as, uh, to represent him. And he started making his next show, which was called Banality. And this was the career-defining moment. Uh, and uh, Jeff also made artworks to advertise the show. And uh, they, some, you know, art dealers, galleries take ads in art magazines to announce their shows. But Jeff who was a kind of marketing genius as well as a brilliant artist, um, made separate ads in four different art magazines featuring him in different situations to advertise the show. I've spoken to a number of younger artists who said, particularly European artists, whose first experience of Jeff Koons was through these ads and got interested in his work because no one had done this kind of almost movie advertising for a show that he put into three galleries simultaneously in three cities in two different countries, in New York, Chicago, and Cologne in Germany. And he made, it was a sculpture show. Everything was made in editions of three. It was called Banality. And once again, no one had ever seen anything quite like this. Well... We're, we ran out of time, and we have to keep to our schedule. So if uh, Jeffrey would like to add something else. Oh, here we have him with Ducky and uh, 
and Jeffrey in that this photograph. This is just the context of this so, is the show. Can I, uh, can I read something very yes, quickly? Yes, briefly then, yes. I, I wanted to, uh, Matt Mulliken was a, an artist that um, Jeff uh, was friendly with in the early 80s, and Matt married Valerie Smith, having been introduced by Jeff. And uh, Matt told me a story about um, his bachelor party, which was at home in his loft with a bunch of his male artist friends, and they proceeded, as Jeffrey was saying, to get blind drunk. And after several hours of drinking, and they were sitting in his loft at a long table uh, with candles. And um, Matt tells this story. It was 1987, we had a table, and all my friends were there, mostly artists, uh, all the guys, and I'll never forget this. It was at the end of the party, and Jeff is on one side of the table and I'm on the other. And there's a candle in the middle, just one candle. And he said to me, you know, remember they were all very drunk, it's our job to keep that candle lit. That's our job. We were all sloshed, Matt said. I mean, really drunk. But I remember him very clearly saying it was our job to keep that candle lit. Because I wanted to know, okay, what's the candle? I wanted to know. It's really the impulse, the purity, the strength, the stuff of what art is, the stuff that doesn't get consumed. He believes this. He's telling me the truth. He's not lying to me. He's not trying to cover anything over my eyes. He's never, ever tried to lie to me. I respect him for that. Our job is to keep the candle lit. Thank you.